Hi everybody. Thanks so much for joining me today. This is Research with Lorelei number two. And it's about brain retraining research and research with regards to uh, mind-body therapies and cognitive behavior therapy. So welcome. And uh, this follows um, Research with Lorelei number one and uh, my original one with uh, my uh, recovery from chronic fatigue syndrome using brain retraining and the research behind it. And I'll put those links in the video description below if you haven't seen those. So um, so this goes on with uh, more research with regards to brain retraining. And um, I do have more uh, research with regards to the Gupta program in my uh, video entitled, Which Brain Retraining Program is Right for Me? And I go a, a little bit more into the research behind the Gupta program. So I'll put that link in the video uh, description as well. So as always, thank you so much for joining me. I'm so excited about uh, learning and science and research. And as always, um, this video is for informational purposes only. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not a uh, you know, psychologist or trained clinical counselor, not a medical practitioner. So this information is merely from my journey and uh, my interest in research and any imp implementation should be discussed with your own medical team. Okay, and my, um, my intention in making these videos is um, to share my story and share some of the things that I found helpful in the hopes that um, somebody who is suffering can find a way out of their, their predicament. Okay, so thank you so much. Um, so we're jumping ahead to where I finished off last with um, what I call the nine principles in brain retraining and mind-body therapies. Okay, so I, I put it, I'll put I'll put this in the video description so that um, you all can and can have it. Um, so I'm going to use these nine principles and um, sort of pull out papers and see and show you how they sort of follow um, all these principles um, because. Uh, you know, the Gupta program, the DNRS, are, are two such brain retraining programs, and there are a few more. Um, so we'll just go through each step. So uh, number one is, uh, is that all the programs emphasize that you need to believe that there is misfiring in the brain, that, you know, that your, your brain is perceiving pain or danger, and... Um, and it's not accurate. So it's there's a, a leap of faith there. So that's number one. Um, number two is that most of the brain retraining programs um, say that you need to be mindful. So we talked about being mindful in the previous video, being present in the moment and sort of identifying and stopping any triggering thoughts of fear, pain, or worry. And the goal is to do this 24-7. And that is to get your, your mind and your body to relax and to heal and to get out of that stuck fear overdrive with all the associated hormones and, um, and you know, and dysfunction. And um, all the programs have some type of daily homework. And that could be brain retraining exercises. It could be CPT skills, CPT uh, tools meditation, uh, positive visualizations, relaxation exercises. And again, this is all to ensure that your mind and body is in a parasympathetic rest, heal, digest state to get you out of wherever, you, whatever stuck uh, pain loop or stuck um, sympathetic overdrive loop. And um, the programs vary, uh, usually from 30 to 60 minutes, but there are some that sort of go outside that. Um, most of the um, brain retraining programs have some kind of what they call gradual exposure therapy, or some call it incremental training, and that is to actually increase your activity level um, training through triggers. So let's say for me, you know, I was training from being bedridden uh, 23 hours a day to gradually sitting up longer and longer, and to sort of set up myself to say, okay, I'm going to sit up for... Uh, 10 minutes right now and then tomorrow I'll do like 11 minutes 
and to change my body's response do visualizations meditations joyful uh joyful activities etc to uh, get my body out of that uh, that state um, while i'm incrementally training and exposing uh, myself to different triggers uh, number five is engaging in joyful activities and get happy. So um, that this actually normalizes your neurochemical cocktail. Um, and you can be laughing, dancing, um, joyful visualizations. And it, as I've said in um, my previous videos, you know, the, the overfiring fear stress response, it disrupts so many different systems. And it actually changes the, the chemistry in your brain so that you're sort of predisposed to think negatively, to, um, you know, discount the positive and um, always sort of look at the negative. Um, and it's, it's because there's a, 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 it's, it's a limbic, what I call a limbic distortion, where the, the limbic system is sort of, uh, you know, taking your brain and, and showing your world through a very narrow negative lens. So that's number five, is engaging in joyful activities. Uh, number six is they all use some type of CBT skills or emotional processing, uh, learning to deal with psychological pain, um, emotions through self-compassion, um, uh, and they all have skills and tools to improve your psychological health and decrease your negative self-dialogue. Because as I said in the previous videos, your limbic system you know, has, is always on the lookout for those two dangers. The physical danger, like, oh, you know, sitting up or, you know, that food or mold or a perfume or, um, you know, whatever your, your limbic system has gotten fearful of. And also, you know, I'm not worthy. I've... I, you know, I can't put myself first and, and, you know, I can't put my self-care first and all that negative self-dialogue, they all have an element of dealing with, with that. Uh, nature therapy, um, getting outside, photography, forest bathing, walking, um, some, some brain retraining programs uh, advocate that. And um, finally, some type of exercise. So Tai Chi, Qigong, yoga, muscle strengthening exercises, uh, stretching, walking, uh, balance, uh, some type of movement or exercise with the ed educational support that activity is not harmful. And lastly, uh, a couple of the brain retraining programs actually advocate um, some uh, element of spiritual faith. So those are sort of the nine principles. <laughs> I'm going to try and go over them. Um, using some examples. So I hope this is um, not too overwhelming. So as I, I'm going to pull out um, the Ashar paper. So I've talked about this Ashar paper, which I really like um, a couple of times now. It was um, per, um, published in uh, September of 2021 in the Journal of uh, American Medical Association of Psychiatry. And um, it's so it's called uh, Effect of Pain Reprocessing Therapy whoops, versus Placebo and Usual Care for Patients with Chronic Back Pain. And um, so let's, let's go through the nine principles using this paper, okay? Because that's pretty incredible. Um, I think I've told you that uh, there was 151 subjects. Um, in the book, uh, sorry, in the study, and um, let, let's go through the principles. So number one principle was, okay, believe. So um, they use what they call pain reprocessing uh, therapy, and um, in their paper, they didn't actually go through a, a lot of detail about that, but um, Pain reprocessing therapy, I'm assuming from what I read in the paper, um, is that it's very similar to pain, what they call pain neuroscience education. And uh, two very famous physical therapists, uh, David Butler and Lorimer Mosley, 
wrote a very book, good book called Explain Pain. There, um, I'm like that. Explain Pain by David Butler and Laura Mosley. And, you know, if there were rock stars or superstars in the physical therapy world, these two would be it. Um, pioneers in uh, treatment of pain, pain management, and um, uh, a lot of great articles. And so um, that book, Explain Pain, uh, is, is at probably at your library. It's in my library. Um, and um, they... They explain it very well in that um, nociplastic persistent pain is caused by the brain. So I'll just put that in sort of layman's terms. Uh, pain, persistent pain is caused by the brain. And it is basically telling patients, and there's a, a lot, so much research that supports this, um, it, it, you know, F MRIs and F fMRIs and brain scans, etc. That we be we we believe that chronic pain is a sign of tissue damage and danger. So, for these people who had chronic pain in their back, they believed that the pain was a sign of tissue damage and danger, and that belief is inaccurate if there is because there's um for these patients there was no documented um pathology that could explain the pain that they were suffering and so and to educate them in the accurate belief that pain is created when the brain perceives danger okay so the pain is a signal not that there's actual tissue damage and danger, but the signal is um, because the brain thinks, okay, there's danger here. If I move a certain way, I'm, there's, uh, there's danger. I'm going to give this person a, a pain or a pain signal. Now, there's a certain sort of um, pr principles that, uh, that s sort of neural... I don't know what to call it, neuro, neurological education principles. I don't know how to, what exactly to call them. But um, so the brain is prone to mistakes and has a negative bias when assessing danger. So let's say um, I've got a sore knee and I'm going to go down the stairs or I've got a sore back and I'm going to, you know, uh, bend over. Um, the brain is sort of anticipating that there's going to be danger and it actually um, has a negative bias and it can actually extrapolate to different situations too. Now what does that sound like? <laughs> so it, um, so of course if you take this to the chronic fatigue syndrome model and the, the dog underneath the bed with the thunderstorm sounds and you know my, my first video with the, the Pavlov's dog with the ringing of the bell and the salivation response, the, is, the brain is prone to mistakes and has a negative bias. So it's going to start ex expanding what it is thinks is triggering. Um, and the brain actually will build and strengthen pathways that support this belief, whether the belief is correct or not. And lastly, the brain pathways can be changed by our choices of what we think, feel, and act. Now, as I said, there's um, this pain neuroscience education and CBT, um, there's thousands of articles about CBT and how um, it can effectively change pain. Now, the N, the Asher article takes it further by not only using CBT, but it also, so it does the pain neuroscience education the pain reprocessing therapy. There was 151 patients with a functional MRI, a randomized controlled study, and a one-year follow-up. Now, how did they how did they actually do this? Because we all it's like, wow, we want to know. Um, so there was one telehealth session with a physician, 
and eight psychological treatments over four weeks. And so there was belief in that um, there was a education to help patients reconceptualize their pain as due to non-dangerous brain activity rather than peripheral tissue injury. And um, they used a combination of uh, various techniques, um, you know, cognitive techniques, exercise te techniques, and exposure-based techniques. So again, that gradual exposure therapy and exercise. And um, so at a baseline, there was a low to moderate severity of pain, 4.1 out of 10, and the mean pain duration was 10 years. And the placebo was um, an open label subcutaneous saline injection in the back. So basically, the people who were getting placebo knew they were just getting the salt solution injected in the, in the back. And so, um, as I said, 66% of these patients who were received pain re reprocessing therapy after four weeks were pain-free or nearly pain-free, compared to 20% with the placebo and 10% to with the treatment as usual, and treatment effects were maintained at the one-year follow-up. Now, the longitudinal uh, functional MRI showed um, increased uh, connections between the um, prefrontal cortex to dampen the pain response, a decreased response in the insula, which is a limbic-related, uh, it has strong connections to the limbic fear um, primitive brain, and um, a decreased uh, connections to the somatosensory cortex or the, the, the pain, pro uh, where they would feel the pain in the body. And so, um, they were, so they, they had eight one-hour therapy sessions twice a week for four weeks, and they were provided with personalized evidence for, for that, that their pain was in their brain. Um, they were, uh, had gradual exposure therapy where they were seated, engaged in feared postures or movements. Um, they engaged in uh, CBT and mindfulness and MBSR, which is based, um, mindfulness-based stress reduction techniques. Um, they were uh, taught how to uh, process difficult emotions um, and um, increase positive emotions, get happy, um, engage in self-compassion, uh, decrease pain catastrophizing, um, put pain coping skills, pain acceptance, and promoting engagement in valued life activities. So, um, so they engaged in sort of in the nine sort of um, principles. Um, I would say they did almost all of them except for the nature therapy and the spiritual faith one. So I'll put the nine um, the nine uh, principles in the video description so they can go through as I because this uh, this video is getting really long and. Uh, there was two more papers. Well, actually, there's four more papers I wanted to talk about, but I'll just go faster. Um, that they all engage in belief and stopping the fear triggers, daily homework, gradual exposure therapy, engaging in joy, uh, learning to deal with um, psychological health and emotional therapy, and um, exercise. And a couple of them do nature and spiritual faith. Okay, so that was um, Ashar. So um, the next one I'm going to talk about is by uh, Dr. Uh, Serrat uh, from Spain. She um, is both a physical therapist and a psychologist. And she um, published this paper in Physical Therapy in uh, September of 2021, and it is called um, Effectiveness of a Multi-Component Treatment Based on Pain Neuroscience Education, uh, Therapeutic Exercise, Cognitive Behavior Therapy, and Mindfulness in Patients with Fibromyalgia. So, um, 
It was a 12-week multi-component treatment and um, 272 patients. And for the patients who um, were in this program, um, the nine principals, I think they uh, were all there except the, um, sorry. Um, so all the principles were used, um, except for nature therapy and um, spiritual faith again. So um, so uh, there was a large effect size um, between the control and the experimental group. They had uh, 12 weeks of treatment. And um, they had improvements in functional impairment, pain, uh, kinesiophobia, which is fear of movement, and physical function, and a moderate effect size with fatigue, anxiety, and depression. So their belief um, and their pain neuroscience education was that fibromyalgia involves hypersensitization of the central nervous system of the brain. is a malfunction between... Um, inhibitory pathways of, 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 of pain, like damping the pain response, and facilitating pathways of increasing sensitivity to pain and touch. So there's a malfunction in there with the descending and ascending pathways in the brain and the nervous system. And um, they're taught that um, these pathways are moderated or influenced by cognitive biases and beliefs, uh, negative and maladaptive thoughts emotional behavioral factors that say, you know, are they happy? Because you're not going to, you're going to perceive life differently if you're happy versus if you're depressed. Um, dysfunctional beliefs, distortion of perception. And um, they were taught that any credible evidence of danger or safety in the body can increase or decrease pain perception. So if they were were led to believe that, you know, um, stretching this way is not harmful to your body tissues. It is a misfiring of pain in your brain. Then that over time with the gradual exposure and gradual exercise and the education, that would actually decrease their pain response and over time increase their um, function. So, um, yeah, they did uh, aerobic exercise, they did uh, posture correction, stretching, balance training, low impact, impact walking, and guess what? The uh, intervention was carried out in a playful way uh, with role playing and they were in group settings where they're in, and getting group support and um, in joyful uh, exercises, they had... Um, Goal setting, so uh, visualizations of where they would like to be. Um, they did self-monitoring, and they did reinforcement, and um, five point six percent of the patients uh, showed greater than a seventy percent improvement in their fibromyalgia impact uh, quality of life score, um, and fifty one point eight five percent showed more than a twenty percent reduction in their. Um, in their uh, fibromyalgia impact uh, score. So um, that was pretty exciting. And I'm gonna actually do another one by Surat. Um, so uh, partly because I love her stuff and she's a physical therapist and I just love her stuff. Um, so this one's called um, Effectiveness of a Multi-Component Treatment for Fibromyalgia Based on Pain Neuroscience Education. So all about belief exercise therapy, psychological support, and nature exposure, a pragmatic randomized control trial. That was pre, um, published in the Journal of Clinical Medicine in 2020. And it's very similar to the other one I talked about, except that she does use nature uh, therapy there, um, nature photography, forest bathing, walking, Nordic walking poles, 169 patients. Um, and so... Um, 
I guess what I'm just trying to emphasize here is that it's really exciting to me that if if the, if we can sort of understand the principles of how to get better, you know, for the people who have, you know, chronic fatigue syndrome, chronic pain, fibromyalgia, then we can sort of pick and choose and try out different principles. And because we really, all we want is everybody to get better. So um, that's what I'm hoping that, so that you can understand from my papers and the principles that that's what, that this is an education for you. It's like, okay, wow. Okay, I need to believe that I can get better. I need to do daily exercises. I need to um, do visualizations. I need to do things that, are, that make me happy because I need to get my body in a relaxed, healthy, healing, rest, digest response and out of that stress response. Okay? So, um, you know, I'm going to squeeze in two more because um, uh, the... The Gupta program, I did talk about the Gupta program, the trial from um, the mindfulness-based program plus amygdala and insular retraining program for the treatment of women with fibromyalgia, a pilotized controlled, um, that was in the journal of clinical medicine, a pilot randomized controlled trial. So I did talk about that in the other videos. 37% uh, decrease in how fibromyalgia negatively impacted their lives, 40% decrease in anxiety and depression, 47% increase in perceived health after doing the program for eight weeks. And um, I didn't talk about the brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Um, that factor has been found elevated in the blood serum of fibromyalgia patients, and it appears to play a role in chronic pain. And it was found to be significantly reduced in the patients that use the Gupta program in eight weeks. So um, that's in the, um, and of course that program uh, uses actually all nine principles of the um, principles that I presented. Okay, this is last. Okay, this is um, the called uh, what is the molecular signature because it's molecular biology that's so exciting to me <laughs> um, what is the molecular signature of mind-body interventions a systematic review of gene expression changes induced by meditation and related practices um, so it it reviews um, 18 papers uh, about what is happening on a genetic and molecular basis through um, blood samples and uh, DNA samples, uh, et cetera, of exactly what's going on with um, people who go through mind-body therapies and what changes happen. And so um, Black et al. Uh, in this paper, he used a type of meditation called Kirtan Kriya meditation. And um, the there was 23 family dementia caregivers and in the experimental group and 23 in the control group were not caregivers. And um, the experimental, sorry. <laughs> there was 23 family dementia caregivers um, and um, I'm getting mixed up. Anyway, um, there's a, a control group and the caregivers were um, instructed to use this meditation uh, 12 minutes every day for eight weeks. And the it starts off with a minute of mind-body awareness, and it's followed by chanting. And the chant is birth, life, death, rebirth. Birth, life, death, rebirth. And... Um, there's an audio track and they're supposed to do it every day. And just that 12 minutes for eight weeks was enough to downregulate 49 genes and upregulate 19 genes. Um, so the 49 genes that were downregulated um, were related to um, pro inflammatory gene expression. So for those who are science geeks, it's sort of a 
related to the nuclear factor kappa b and so the nuclear factor kappa b uh, is a is a involved when stress activates the sympathetic nervous system so um, the 49 genes were uh, down regulated in expressing the uh, sort of the if the nuclear factor kappa b set of of genes and and proteins and the 19 upregulated um, genes were an increase in irf1 which is just an antiviral uh, gene expression so it's a increased um, um, immune response against viruses. So I thought that was pretty good. And so the, I've been classifying that as, as spiritual, daily, and um, exercise, because they're doing uh, yoga. Um, anyway, it's it was it was just a nice kind of like 12 minutes. <laughs> it's like, so that was really interesting. And um, for those who are interested, I am going to put the um, reference Religion, spirituality, and health. Because, oh, uh, sorry, the spiritual component is actually also in the Gupta program. It, uh, Ashok Gupta, um, in his Meaning of Life app, he reconciles scientific materialism and uh, spiritual belief and religion, um, because there's sort of a sort of a convergence of uh, scientific materialism with sort of um, uh, quantum me quantum mechanics and sort of new uh, findings with uh, dark matter and uh, consciousness, etc., and religion, so that there's a coming together where, it, you know, before it used to be you that science you, you thought was supporting this and religion was supporting this. Well, actually, there's a coming together of understanding um, that they're not mutually ex exclusive. And so, um, this paper is a great paper about how um, people who have a uh, religious faith, a spiritual practice, a spiritual faith, are psychologically and physically do much better, or have much better scores in health and wellness than people who do not have a uh, spiritual faith or religious practice. So um, that is the nine, the nine principles of uh, brain retraining and um, and they can be found in various uh, quantities in mind body therapies and CBT um, so I've tried to put it a lump it all together so that um, it gives you sort of an idea of where we're at with regards to mind body um, and uh, brain retraining research so thank you so much for joining me um, thank you for your time um, you can message me uh, using Messenger to my Facebook page, Lorelai Lu. I'll leave my Instagram uh, account there for messages as well, in case uh, you can't get me through Messenger. And uh, DNRS community members can message me on the forum. And um, I do have one uh, small request um, in that it does take me quite a long time to prepare the scripts for these videos. And um, if you feel called, to make a small charitable donation on my behalf to a charity of your choice or mine, our World Wildlife Fund and um, Red Cross, um, it, to, to kind of just uh, uh, thank me for my time and my work. I would so love it. And then if you could message me and tell me that you've done that, I would um, be so grateful. Um, but if you're not in, is not in your financial training zone, and you're not not called to to do that, that's absolutely fine. Um, I'm wishing you well and wishing you happiness, and I'll continue on with the research, Lorelai number three. Thank you.